<laughs> After a brief photo shooting, it seems that we are already to start. Uh, we are ready to start. So, hello everyone and welcome uh, to the European Studies Center at St. Anthony's College and uh, the Six of Seminar Series. Uh, this is a hybrid event, and I would like to warmly welcome both uh, those in the room as well as our online audience. Um, and presenters. Hello, Jesse. Um, I'm Mariana Sopulio, lecturing in history at Temple College and a research associate at CISOX. And it is a great pleasure to chair uh, today's session um, that derives from Professor Kostovicheva's uh, new book titled Reconciliation by Steel How People Talk About War Crimes. So, drawing on her examination of the Balkan conflicts, uh, Denisa will discuss a novel approach uh, to evaluating the effects of transnational justice in, in post-conflict societies and its policy in implications for peace building uh, presented in her book. So today we have three uh, very eminent speakers with us. I will only briefly introduce them by referring to their names and affiliations. So firstly, we have uh, Denisa uh, Kostovicheva, who is an associate professor of global politics at uh, the European Institute um, at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Secondly, we have Jesse uh, Barton Kornesova, who is a meritory global fellow at uh, the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and uh, Kafoskari University in Venice. And thirdly, we have um, John Glenhill, uh, who is an associate professor of global governance at Oxford's Department of um, International Development and a fellow at St. Uh, Rose College. So before we begin, uh, I would like to briefly explain the choreography of uh, this seminar. Denisa will present her book for about 30 minutes, and then the two discussions will have 10 minutes each, and a Q&A session will follow uh, with the audience attending both online and in person. Um, and the seminar is expected to last one hour and 45 minutes. So with great anticipation and excitement, uh, Denise, are we here? Marilena, thank you for that kind of introduction. And uh, I would like to uh, thank everybody at CSOX uh, for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to talk about uh, the book. So I'll make a few uh, introductory comments about the book, hoping to uh, pique your interest in it and to stimulate the discussion. So this is a book about what happens after mass atrocity. So when violence stops, people confront what happened, they confront their loss and suffering, and they begin uh, the search uh, for justice. So basically, the book investigates when this happens, when people begin to reflect whether it is possible to have reconciliation across the lines of conflict, which in the case that I'm interested in uh, is ethnic violence. And this is the question that animates the scholars and practitioners of peace building, and more specifically, the scholars of transitional justice. And because I will be uh, referring to this term of transitional justice, I'll just uh, to spend a minute or two um, on, on the concept and to say what we mean by transitional justice. So basically, transitional justice is a field of scholarly research and practice that deals with uh, practices employed by states, societies, and individuals uh, to address the legacy of human rights violations. And it is called transitional, that's why we have this clunky term, because uh, it is quest for justice in the, in the period of great uh, political uh, flux, uh, in a moment of transition from conflict to peace, but also from uh, authoritarian or totalitarian regimes uh, to, uh, to democracy. My work 
uh, so this is kind of a large field, and my work, uh, as Marilyn correctly said, looks at uh, so this post conflict, post conflict uh, processes. Now, this is a um, sort of a has been a fast growing field, and um, scholars no longer talk about just the uh, transitional justice after the conflict ends. I think uh, uh, the current uh, conflict in Ukraine is very interesting because people begin to talk about uh, justice in conflict, in other words, before the conflict ends. And also there is interesting research that looks at uh, post-transitional justice and scholars are interested in looking at, for example, what happens in in Spain, when kind of democracy, democracy consolidates, but yet the justice issues, the issues of human rights violations haven't been uh, addressed. So to introduce the book, um, I thought I would start by uh, sort of, uh, addressing this, uh, the issue of stealth and how I used and why I used this uh, sort of, uh, uh, notion in the book. I'm sure. But, uh, working the, the okay. yeah. so so first uh why stealth and that brings me to the puzzles um that we uh, address in uh, the constant context of transitional justice research so this whole idea of transitional justice the way we approach it it's a it's a it's an emancipatory concept and it's emancipatory in the sense that it is assumed that once you address the legacy of past wrongs, uh, there will be sort of some good outcomes coming out of it. So certainly you need to address uh, sort of, uh, human rights violations in order to promote peace, in order to promote reconciliation, in order to strengthen democracy, in order to strengthen uh, rule of law. Um, and hence, very often, see sort of the discussion that there is no peace without justice, and not just discussions in academic literature, but we can also see it sort of, you know, in the news when you look at any conflict. So, this is kind of a starting sort of a proposition and kind of foundational premise of transitional justice. Uh, this, re this field has really developed, sort of taken off after the end of the Cold War. Um, it's a very dynamic and kind of fast moving uh, research agenda. And uh, what has happened uh, in this period is that instead of observing positive outcomes, scholars have observed unintended bad effects of transitional practice. In other words, the very same practices, such as, for example, war crime trials or through commissions in various contexts, instead of creating sort of good benefits to society, this positive, uh, sort of uh, kickstarting positive uh, dynamics, have actually had the opposite. So, therefore, um, uh, scholars have sort of shown in a number of examples how the pursuit of transitional justice can further divide societies. Uh, and antagonize uh, the groups in conflict, how it can slower, slow down the democratization, um, uh, and in general, have exactly the opposite effect of what was caused. So we know, for example, in the Western Balkans, if you look at, uh, uh, if you look at um, uh, what happened in the relation to international criminal tribunal, it's only the slide, it's the first mechanism that introduced transitional justice in this region, was that um, suspects were extradited to uh, throughout the region, uh, uh, to the Hague, hailed as heroes, and now given that so much time has, has passed, some have returned and they have again been welcomed as heroes. So basically, you know, annulling any effect of, uh, of, the whole, of the whole process. The verdicts have been questioned, and just the very fact that um, uh, commission of uh, war crimes was on a mass scale, that just a small handful of justice and, you know, disappointed, uh, disappointed the, the victims. So in general, when we talk about transitional justice and research, I would say that there is almost a hegemonic uh, research agenda in the field 
that people are looking and investigating why transitional justice fails. I mean, there is no doubt that it does fail, okay? But I think that this uh, sort of just preoccupations with what doesn't work has prevented us from saying what actually works. And this is where I started in this book. So, you know, this idea of stealth would come in, in that respect. Might there be something that is happening that we are not capturing just because we're looking at unintended um, uh, sort of bad effects or consequences? And this is why I reverse the puzzle uh, in the book. And I start out with the question when does transitional justice work? The second meaning of self that I sort of, um, uh, sort of how self comes into this sort of whole uh, 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 book is the question of okay, so when if we pose the question of how does it, you know, when does transitional justice work, it's a big question. Well, how do we know that it works? And this question turns on the issue of transitional justice and uh, evidence. Um, what is quite uh, sort of notable uh, about transitional justice as a, as a, as a field of uh, scholarly inquiry is that as scholars have claimed, many of the claims are actually faith-based rather than fact-based. In other words, we have our, our, our evidence uh, for claims that are made about the effects of transitional justice a little bit uh, shaky, uh, to say uh, the least. Uh, I would say within this huge body of research uh, and research is conducted in, 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 in different uh, disciplines is that um, in particular, uh, sort of a quantitative research has been almost, as I would say, uh, mainstream. Most of the research has been, if you like, uh, uh, qualitative, uh, ethnographic, and it is indeed that provided very interesting and important uh, insights into how transitional justice works. But um, on the quantitative side, scholars have been um, mainly used uh, surveys, uh, more recently survey experiments. So you have sort of, uh, again, interesting insights, uh, but also capturing the people's opinion about different transitional justice mechanisms and what it has achieved. And within this kind of, um, uh, these efforts to create evidence that has been noted, uh, I think uh, uh, the study of discourse takes up a very kind of an interesting and paradoxical uh, position. Everything in traditional justice is about discourse. So you could, uh, you know, you can take any book on transitional uh, or, uh, or article on transitional justice, it's about uh, this, a global discourse of human rights or, Discourse, you know, what politicians say to, you know, to discredit, let's say, uh, international tribunals, uh, what we can say about each other, et cetera, et cetera. But the, there is very little rigorous research, uh, such as discourse analysis as such. Um, and I would say, I won't say completely none, but sort of very few articles, I would say, that uh, look at uh, discourse in a more systematic way. And to my knowledge, uh, there hasn't been any study of a systematic analysis of discourse. So this is where kind of this idea of stealth comes when we talk about uh, discourse, that actually there may be some patterns that we could capture and it would, could happen or not happen, we don't know, or I didn't know before I, uh, when I conducted this study. Uh, that, that may be there and exist by stealth. And then the third uh, way uh, how the stealth comes in, uh, it comes through this, what I would say has now become a collocation, both in uh, academic uh, 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 literature and uh, sort of, uh, sort of journalistic pieces, that when people talk about reconciliation in various contexts, it always alludes to reconciliation, just that's a brilliant. Doesn't really happen. It's so hard. It's such a demanding concept uh, that it it, it 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 doesn't happen. And the reason is because scholars have written about the fact, um, and I've contributed to some of these debates uh, based on my other research that um, reconciliation as a concept and practice is 
is rejected in, uh, in the post-conflict societies. Uh, some scholars have written about reconciliation being a dirty word. Just people don't want to hear about reconciliation. And the reason they don't want to hear about reconciliation or won't have, don't want to have anything uh, to do with it is because they've been uh, witnessing how um, political elites uh, instrumentalize and use reconciliation, right? Uh, they pledge so that they would do something because they would give them a nice points, for example, with their international sort of partners and overseers and then yet don't do anything uh, sort of meaningful to advance uh, any sort of betterment of the intergroup relations. But also, uh, people are disenchanted with how the international community through different NGOs and external grants approaches reconciliation is again very instrumentally. So that's that's one sort of side of that reality. And that, when you do a sort of field work, and I do have done field work in uh, different areas of the Balkans, there is a there is a different dynamic as well that you hear about uh, from uh, sort of uh, different different uh, constituencies, if you like, and that is that despite reconciliation being rejected and politicized, when it comes to it, people do yearn to some sort of restoration of of of, of relations, and I was really surprised uh, sort of an interested. To hear uh, during research, uh, for example, in dialogue with uh, representatives of different human rights organizations, who would take the youth uh, from different ethnic groups in the Balkans and they would take them to, for example, uh, to a different place. First, they would bring them together, which is quite important because everybody lives in their segregated places uh, nowadays after the war. And they would take them somewhere, for example, to do sports, right? Because you know, to tell someone, let's go somewhere and discuss what happened in the war, I think that would not really be very attractive to the youth. <laughs> and then what they say is that, you know, when they go there uh, to a third place, that they do start with sports, but inevitably they come to the to the topics of war. Then some somewhere is kind of and then. Uh, they actually, you know, engage in the meaningful uh, discussions about war. So this is this idea. This is how I think I take this idea of stealth in relation to this politicized concept of uh, reconciliation. So coming to the topic of uh, reconciliation, motivated by these theoretical and theoretical and policy related questions. I undertook a study of the process, which is called the Recon process in the Balkans, to glean whether reconciliation uh, is uh, possible. So I just thought, uh, because a lot of, uh, uh, a great deal really hinges on kind of the evidence that was brought into it, right, the empirical case, I thought it would be uh, sort of worth standing in this introductory section about the few minutes on, on this process itself before then I review uh, my uh, findings. So RECOM process, and RECOM is an acronym, this kind of a, 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 the name uh, of the civil society initiative, which advocates for the funding, and you can come along with, of a regional commission for establishing the fact about war crimes and other serious human rights uh, violations in uh, former Yugoslavia in the period of the decade of the wars in former Yugoslavia, uh, from 91 to 2001, uh, established in 2008. Um, I'm not uh, the only scholar who have been fascinated and interested in this uh, initiative. And I would say, if you survey the literature until recently, I think, um, you know, the only sort of com uh, comparatively is sort of, uh, it, it competed in terms of interest to read uh, international criminal, criminal tribunal in the Hague, in terms of how many, you know, the, the transitional justice initiatives that scholars have been interested in. 
this initiative has been uh, unique uh, and worthy of uh, inquiry to, to in, in, is, uh, because of its characteristics that stand out, and I would say in global terms in relation to other conflicts, um, uh, because we try to innovate. Um, uh, and this innovation is, I think, applicable to regions, not just uh, in the world. So the first idea is there of a regional commission, right? So normally when we talk about commission, um, we talk about state commission, right? So uh, for example, South Africa Commission or any other commission, the Food and Reconciliation Commission. But they think this idea of regional uh, uh, commissions with the regional dimensions, uh, so just from my logic that the conflict was regional across border, right? So after uh, the conflict, you end up situation where you have victims in one place, evidence in another place, and you know, sort of relatives in a third country. And if you really want to make sense of what's happening, that process has to be uh, that happens. It has to be cross border, it has to be regional uh, uh, itself. So, uh, and you can just look at in, right? Uh, you know, uh, Great Lakes uh, or even the Syrian conflict with the movement of population. So, uh, so there is this regional dynamic. Uh, the second, uh, sort of uh, multi ethnic versus uh, mono ethnic, but also what I meant here that more mirrors the idea of regional, right? So, not multi ethnic in the sense like. Uh, a country with both you know, the ethnic, but multi ethnic, where you have lots of ethnic groups who are involved in different uh, sort of, uh, ways in the, in the virus. It's a grassroots initiative, uh, completely initiated uh, by civil society, and as a response of a lack of interest of states to pursue transitional justice genuinely, so rather than a top down process. And it's grassroots in a sense that it's uh, driven by local actors independently vis-a-vis -vis of local states, but also vis-a-vis -vis external actors. It's something that came from local civil society organizations. And um, here's another interesting uh, kind of element is that it's a fact-finding process. So normally when we talk about uh, different commissions, we talk about truth and reconciliation commissions. But when they started already in 2000s, they realized that these terms, such as truth and reconciliation, have been already politicized. Okay, mm -hmm. so they conscientiously uh, such a, uh, so distanced themselves from these terms that were politicized, and they thought that actually they need to approach to to, to, to delicately find a way to this tricky political dynamics, right, where every concept is politicized and instrumentalized by focusing on that. Okay, let's just name all the victims by name and see, and this is how we make the record of war. In the Yugoslav mm -hmm. context, you know, because we worked on a book together on the legacies of uh, Yugoslavia, we know that even though uh, the region had successive wars, there has never been a record of war that. So therefore, these figures have always remained there to be instrumentalized for the next war. So that's what they also sort of was a strong motivation to create the list of all the victims. Um, you know, so it prevents the kind of manipulation with the number of victims that actually led to the conflicts of the 19, uh, 1990s. So what this um, sort of, uh, initiative has done, which I think is rather unique, and I've looked at a lot of other examples of um, uh, consultations as a one form of transitional justice, for example, in Burundi, and elsewhere um, is that they organized uh, over 100 consultations. What consultation means is that they initiated meetings with civil society, with victims, with teachers, journalists, um, lawyers, uh, youth groups, etc. throughout uh, the area of former Yugoslavia. They had meetings in local communities, meetings at the national level, and they had meetings also at 
the regional level. And in these meetings, basically they led, led the debate and the discussion with the civil society, with these representatives, these people who attended these consultations, and asked them what would be the, the best sort of approach to address transitional justice. And it was kind of a two-stage process. Uh, at one point, it was this idea of a regional dimension that crystallized, which then turned into this regional fact-finding um, commission, this whole. And the second kind of stage of the process was that through this process of consultations, they created a draft statute, what they thought would be a draft statute of the future of the future commission. And this statute basically codified everything, all the modalities uh, uh, sort of, of the work of the future commission. So for example, the definition of victim, testimonies, relationship with the media, um, sort of uh, very tricky, sort of, um, uh, the term of the commission, et cetera, et cetera, which led to the adoption of the draft, draft statute. And it's called draft statute because the, the goal was for this commission to become interstate commission because they thought Actually, if it's the state who collaborate creating this list uh, of war dead, of victims, is that will give uh, the whole initiative greater legitimacy rather than coming from civil society. And I have a whole kind of separate discussion interwoven about how also civil society is just a, a, a tricky concept in, in, in the context of this. So what happened? So fast forward, and even today, this uh, commission, this fact-finding commission was never established. So the civil society activists, they tried, they advocated. Um, sometimes they had uh, support from different parts of the state, sometimes they didn't. Then there came elections, and somebody else came who didn't support them. And basically, if you look at this sparse literature, uh, scholarly literature that deals with Reckon, uh, all the discussions of Reckon are, are about basically the failure of Reckon, right? And everybody has been focused on this idea that they have not been able to uh, establish this uh, commission. Okay? And there are different explanations that I won't uh, go into. But the whole point is that they neglected this amazing process of consultation that involved about 6,000 people from all different ethnic groups who for the first time after the war sat across from each other at the table and they started to discuss this very difficult issue of war crimes and what to do about them. So basically, RECOM sort of renamed itself as a uh, network and this network is actually now working on um, uh, documenting uh, war crimes through different uh, civil society uh, initiatives. The next one, please. There we go. So this is from their website. And um, how clear it is that it shows kind of like a global picture uh, in the fall of former Yugoslavia, and you can zoom in and go basically to the level of the streets to see what happens to a person. And this is kind of a massive, uh, so they have a whole a methodology. So basically, just the whole point here is that they're continuing with their work. They took on this idea of, 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 of creating uh, the record of, um, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of, of the facts, right? So what, what, what happens? And this uh, process is on uh, going. But because you know there was such a focus on uh, the outcome, I raised the question, but what about the process? And I've uh, uh, attended some of these meetings, uh, I've done interviews, and I've done focus groups. And what, what came through when I spoke with people who participated in these uh, consultations, uh, it talked about these meetings and these exchanges being transformative, the experience being transformed from them. And uh, while uh, Rathom was conducting the consultation, they've done something which is remarkable, and that is they recorded every single consultation. 
they typed it up and the transcripts of these conversations are available on the internet on their web page and have been available for ages. And I've been looking at them while I was competing to apply for grants to uh, to be able to study them because I thought from the from the perspective of a of a, of a researcher this is a treasure trove of information. This is unique information because it shows you. Uh, it gives you naturally occurring discussions. These are there are four million words um all of us to the uh, words of day, right? This is a massive, it's like massive amount of data, right? And very unique data, right? It's 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 different from sort of experiments, <laughs> different you know, details, different kinds of uh, uh manipulation and can potentially provide valuable sort of insights, right? Whether they will sort of show when people disagree or how they disagree or maybe something worse. Right? <laughs> and I use them as a uh, sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, an opportunity to study sort of patterns uh, in, in, in of conversations in, in this data. I was also very dissatisfied, and this is kind of sort of motivating me, with how uh, scholars have used these transcripts. So some of these transcripts have had 20, 40, 50 pages. You know, it's just overwhelming. So then, you know, I would see, I would read different uh, sort of, uh, uh, pieces uh, on record, and I would see, sort of, you know, you know, a few quotes, you know, from some sort of random trust person, completely not systematic. And I was wondering where, you know, I was wondering where is this coming from, right? Based on that, we could pull out anything, you know, from those transcripts because people had very unpleasant exchanges there, you know, sort of uh, strong disagreements, but there was something else there, right? Uh, no one has looked at it systematically to capture the, 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 the patterns in a way that would be repeatable and stand to, to a scrutiny. So what I've done, and this is my concluding uh, bit uh, of the introduction. So I approached reconciliation uh, from the perspective of uh, public communication. And I set out to, um, to find out whether uh, people can reconcile while they address um, uh, this difficult legacy while understanding reconciliation uh, through the perspective of the theory of democratic uh, deliberation. Um, Habermas's theory of communicative action uh, basically uh, uh, shifts attention to um, what is discussed in this literature is deliberative virtues, right? So deliberation is not any type of discussion in debate. Uh, to call communication deliberative, that communication has to fulfill some standard of communication. In other words, people, when they talk to each other, they need to provide rational arguments. They need to uh, orient towards common, common good. They can't look at things that are you know, good just for themselves or for their ethnic group. They need to show respect to others. They need to, uh, the conversation needs to have other regarding logic, uh, et cetera. And the scholars, including the peace, scholars of peace building, have said that actually these type of communications, when it's civil, has a potential to uh, restore uh, relations uh, among antagonists. But there are some very serious gaps in this literature. First, scholars have looked at uh, so to, for example, in Northern Ireland, there were interesting studies of deliberation, but they looked at that as topics that can bring people together. Right? It's like, well, no topic in a divided society, mm -hmm. you yeah, know, it's uh, sort of easy to discuss, right? Uh, but uh, they looked at, for example, whether, you know, the, the issue of education or, you know, in elsewhere, they looked at you know, what we want from peace. But no one has looked at, you know, if we want deliberation have this positive effect or you know, then it has to withstand the the, past, the, 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 the most difficult of tests, and that is to discuss the legacy of war crimes, because that is the issue at the end of the day that divides the societies. Secondly, scholars, especially scholars of transitional justice, 
have used uh, the concept of deliberation descriptively. So they started, you know, this kind of uncompromising logic, but then it slipped into sort of talking about different discussions that bring together different groups. And lastly, uh, people have looked at the deliberation, but looked at only from two, two groups, like Protestants and Catholics, for example, um, interact with each other. And we know that the reality of conflict is much more complex, that you have sometimes three groups, and in the region of conflict, or conflict you have more groups. So what I've done is that I, uh, 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 in this book, I conducted the first empirical study of deliberation, and apply the, the measurement instrument that has been tried elsewhere, validated, but I adapted it to, to capture the quality of deliberation in the random discussions. And the instrument is called Discourse Quality Index. Uh, I looked at, uh, this was the first uh, investigation of deliberation of war crimes. And then I've looked at not just the ethnic, but also multi-ethnic deliberation. And now we'll just uh, review some of the findings. <laughs> so when you quantify, uh, and I've looked at over 1,000 statements, which I uh, coded another with, uh, together sort of independently with another coder to have uh, sort of, uh, established the uh, reliability and validity of coding. Uh, what is very interesting uh, is that once uh, these statistics are there, uh, that show you how many people provide rational arguments, how many statements are um, uh, uncivil, how many are civil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the the picture emerges that actually the liberation is feasible within when we have different ethnic groups uh, talking together even when they talk about war crimes. The second uh, finding is, which is counterintuitive and pushes against everything that we have in the literature, and that is that uh, ethnicity plays an important role in each inter-ethnic discussions. So for example, ethnically polarizing issues increase the quality of the literature. So what, am I, what does that mean? That means that when people find themselves uh, in that environment, discuss uh, very sensitive issues on which basically there is disagreement in broader societies. They make sure that they they pay attention to how they formulate their statements, how they formulate their arguments in the presence of the of the, what we call the other. And another sort of uh, point to uh, sort of finding relating to it is that ethnic diversity is conducive to higher deliberative quality. In other words, because these uh, uh, consultations took place in different settings, you could control um, and check whether the quality of deliberation is higher in mono-ethnic groups or in groups that there are two ethnic groups, three or regional. It's very interesting, and in this sense, uh, the findings from Recon, as a matter of fact, replicate findings of some other scholars who looked at, for example, the liberation in Colombia or the liberation in Belgium, where consistently uh, scholars have found that uh, uh, not the ethnic, but they always have just two groups, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the quality of deliberation is higher than when there is uh, everybody's the same ethnicity in the, in the room. Uh, uh, my book, I think, uh, defines uh, those findings and it shows that regional, so when you have multiplicity of ethnic groups, also is associated with higher uh, quality of the deliberation. Although, uh, when you have three groups, for example, like Bosnia, that's when it becomes more uh, challenging, but still higher than in ethnic groups. And lastly, um, um, what came up uh, very sort of strongly um, from uh, my uh, data is the importance of intra-ethnic divisions for inter-ethnic reconciliation. And I was quite uh, sort of uh, 
I'm just quite stark actually to 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 pick up this pattern that um uh when in these discussions uh people become aware of for example there is an argument. Okay. So for example, those things. So there's an argument that, uh, for example, the argument is between two crops who completely disagree you know, about the responsibility for the war crime, what to be done. And this is, for example, observed by Serbs. I mean, that kind of shatters you know, this idea and something that they've been kind of told or propaganda that all of them are the same. So this, it, and, and not only that, that kind of dynamic. Uh, actually had a, was rather important in creating some sort of a sense of solidarity across uh, uh, the regions. So um, uh, with the victims from, 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 another, from another ethnic group. So just to conclude here, um, so some takeaways of this study is to beyond reference or to the future research. I think there are two takeaways. One is uh, that we really, don't know much about the value of identity for post conflict of Right? So the whole so for the research, even in the context of the liberation in divided societies, everything is about shifting conversation from ethnic issues from us or something that is different towards human rights and thinking about talking about things in such a human rights term, universal terms. Uh, Etc. But my research actually shows something quite different, right? People can bring these ethnic issues, their ethnicity, ethnicness into the conversation without them being used, as some scholars have said, as discursive factors. And that was quite interesting. And I think that's almost kind of logical, right? Because people are killed on the basis of their ethnicity, right? And we can't really simply just erase it and then speak about issues in terms of human rights as if their identity didn't matter. Uh, and related to that, I think that, you know, opens up, I think, whole agenda for studying deliberative interethnic conduct. So this whole entire literature about the liberation and divided societies comes from engagement with outwards uh sort of uh, conduct, conduct processes. But what is kind of quite sort of a huge kind of a gap in this literature is that scholars study whether someone had a sort of a contact with someone previously, whether you know whether um there is a vicarious contact with a friend of a friend, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. How frequent was it? But you know there is a whole area to unpack how the conversation and communication that happens during you know, interacting contact. So, so the, for the merger of the literatures on the liberation and interacting contact in a meaningful way to see how the type of conversation that people have then in turn impacts such of attitude change um, uh, of people who were participating in those uh, discussions. And I think two takeaways for policy would be that, and I think this uh, could be discussed also to do more broadly, for example, in relation to Brexit, uh, this idea of kind of a deliberate like for problems. But here, uh, why I put um, uh, uh, put it down as deliberately problem solving in promoting the institutional justice and peace, I wanted to shift the discussion from um, Sort of, uh, another sort of, uh, stream of research that looks at intergroup dialogues, um, which, you know, there are big question marks how much those. Um, scholars have argued that, you know, when people are brought together to speak whether it's uh, sort of uh, Israelis and Palestinians or even uh, in, in the Balkans, there were intergroup dialogues. Uh, but they actually harden identities because people are brought there to talk about what happened. And I talk about deliberative problem solving. It's not, and I'm just trying to say in, uh, in the book, it's not just talking about what happened. You need to, to talk about what to do about what. That's what can bring people 
together. And this is where I kind of differ from all those who are talking about integral dialogue. And lastly, I think uh, is also uh, the book from the perspective of transitional justice uh, does uh, to raise the question of uh, regional dimension of justice and peace that is still in uh, uh, knowledge about. So. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. And now we have our first discussion. So, Jesse, over to you. Thank you very much. And I'm really sorry I can't be there in person. Huge congratulations, Danisa. Uh, it's a huge achievement. I love the book. Uh, so all the praise uh, about this piece of scholarship. Um, um, I think my comments are mainly, obviously, a praise for the book. But also, I just want to highlight some contributions that... Um, uh, stood up for me and then um, I have some questions maybe to start the discussion going forward but I firstly want to say that um, not only is this an excellent but also very timely contribution as you've already highlighted in your presentation um, and I think it's also kind of speaks to the latest research that we want to be and we should be doing in transitional justice uh, because of the impressive disciplinary breadth. Um, the book really combines some of the best insights, not only from transitional justice and peace building, but also communication studies, so, uh, social psychology, sociology, as well as political science. So I really think this is an example of an interdisciplinary work that um, we should be aiming for. I think what I mostly appreciated about this book, book really was um, the very detailed and, and granular approach to highlighting the inner workings of transitional justice uh, through the discussions of multiple stakeholders. Uh, it's meticulously researched and as already has been highlighted in the presentation, it really is an original contribution to both transitional justice and conflict resolution. Um, I think the main highlight of this book is clearly the innovative conceptual anchoring of reconciliation as a process rather than an aim and the processes of deliberative rationality and discursive solidarity. But I think I also want to highlight uh, the wealth of methodological approaches. Um, so if I could just quickly run through some of the four um, highlights that I really had whilst reading this book for the second time now, I should say. Um, so on the methodology uh, side, um, combining interviews with participant observation with um, very meticulous quantitative textual analysis through coding, but also focus groups can really get us to the bottom of how people uh, truly discuss in terms of quality rather than the content as much. Uh, some of these problems in terms of, you know, what is happening, so to speak, in their minds when they're coming to terms with some of the most dramatic events that ever happened in their lives. Um, and I think it provides us for, for policy reasons. Um, it provides us with some, some strategies how to overcome these issues when we actually look at these topics through this variety of, of data collection methods. I think conceptually uh, to look at re reconciliation as uh, as a process um, that does not only that is not only measured uh, on the merit of uh, you know what it was supposed to achieve and has not achieved within a time frame that we decided um, was going to happen is really something that we should be studying more and we should take seriously. And I think that's the main conceptual contribution of the, of the book. But in addition to that, I think Denisa really brings to the foreground some of the key aspects that have been coming up in quite a lot of IR scholarship recently, such as the role of empathy, the role of solidarity, the role of mutuality and, and respect in, so for example, in diplomatic studies uh, that is well known. But uh, from this study, we can really see how these key, key concepts uh, were driving um, the quality of, of the deliberation that Denisa discusses. And it's also, uh, wonderful that uh, at the end of the book, we we go back, so to speak, to contact theory, to Allport's contact theory, and it, which is then brought back so that we can actually understand how some of these discussions play out uh, on the ground. I think for those of us who are interested in the in the regional, so to speak, empirical findings about what is happening in terms of transitional justice on the ground through um, the actual content, as well as uh, some of the how it's discussed, um, the book also gets to the bottom of some of the contentious debates on the ground. So, for example, 
I really appreciated a section in the book that talks about how genocide and the usage of genocide should be included or not or, or shouldn't be included in some of the terminology used by RECOM. Uh, and really, you know, the use of genocide remains some of the most polarizing issue, especially in Bosnia and Herzegovina, or the concept of victimhood and competitive victimhood, which is especially highlighted in, you know, cases such as Serbia and Kosovo and the contention there, as well as in Bosnia, but also about guilt attribution and what is the role of guilt attribution, as some other scholars have, you know, highlighted when they were looking at the role of um, responsibility and at the dealing with responsibility. Um, and, and I'm thinking, for example, of the work by Eric Gordy um, on, on, on Serbia. And Denisa already highlighted some of some of the findings, which seem uh, counterintuitive. However, again, if we go back to some of the basics of contact theory or even Frederick Barth theories, this is what we would, so to speak, expect. We would expect the the intense, in a way, engagement with groups from the other side to uh, to moderate our discussions and uh, and our thinking. And I think some of the methods really that are used, such as uh, also the usage of focus groups, can only highlight uh, how deliberation then plays out um, on the ground. I think the one contribution that uh, is not mentioned in the book, but that kept coming out to my mind is that from my perspective, the book is also an elaboration of how inclusive and respectful discussion can work in general, not only when we talk about war crimes. I think we, if we think about the current political um, debates, the climate of polarization in the United States or in Britain, as well as in Europe, it provides, uh, I think, a useful um, set of policy advices in terms of how how debates should be led. Um, and I think, and this is now, this is where I get to the second part, which is on the questions. Um, the climate of the, the RECOM discussion was, was on the environment was very unique. It was in person, it wasn't in virtual place, places, it wasn't on social media. It, it had what the original contact theory had as well, the thinking of, you know, this is another human being that I can empathize with because we all share un universal humanity. And I think this is where um, the current debates uh, are not easily replicated because they are usually led online and in virtual spaces, unlike RECOM that was led in person and in a very um, safe safe space. And I think, Denisa, you mentioned that sometimes in the book as well, that there was this feeling, you know, that this, this can be discussed in, in this environment. Uh, so that was potentially one thing, you know, that I had in my mind when I was reading this. Now, I have three, I, have, I had many questions, but I will just focus on, on three so that um, other, you know, participants can obviously ask theirs. I think the one question that I was that I also had was, what was the role of silence? You talk a lot about not only the topics that were discussed, but how they were discussed. But I was also Jesse, wondering... Here's your reminder. Baby bath time. Baby bath time, right. Um, Jesse, Alexa, stop. Apologies. Apologies. Um, Alexa was reminding me that it's baby bath time. Right. Um, so, um, so sorry. So going back to my question, um, I was wondering about the role of silence and what topics were not discussed. If you were in the room and you noticed that some topics were discussed and some participants felt that they couldn't actually voice some opinions or they avoided using some of these terms. And I think this is where the other methods that you were using in addition to the textual analysis were probably useful for that. So, so that, that was the first question I had. Now, obviously the policy question that we all have now looking at, at the region and at, you know, as you were saying, everyone looks at RECOM as a failure is, Reckon from your perspective was a success because of the the process that it uh, that it allowed, so to speak, or facilitated for those who participated. But how do we scale this up for those that have not participated? And um, as we know, the it, it's Reckon remains extremely contested within the wider space in the region. So how what's your thinking about you know how the stealth can actually become public and more visible? And I think that is linked to my final question, which is linked to legitimacy. How can these processes be legitimized in, in the eye of the public? Because that's ultimately what's going to change the reconciliation as we see it in the more traditional sense, if you like. So how do we give these processes more legitimacy um, so that we break through this narrative dissonance and confusion that currently really reigns um, the region about the past? Thank you very much. Congratulations again. Apologies for the disruption and um, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Jesse. And 
Uh, let me start by reiterating the congratulations to Denisa. Uh, it's a delight to see this book. I remember its origins years ago. Uh, there was a pandemic in the meantime, and then a week ago, a book arrives uh, in my sort of letterbox in the department. There was a bit of work going on in the meantime, as it turns out, but uh, it's great to see the end product of, of something that I, that I knew the beginning of. Um, it's a fantastic book. Go out and buy it. Get your libraries to buy it, um, get your family to buy it. Uh, I'm the, not the only one recommending it. As I uh, have the back cover to me, I can see the Richard Kaplan who also endorsed it. Um, there may be a discount. There is no discount. Author. There we go. There's a discount on the last slide. So there we go. So the discount is to come. Uh, but it really is a fantastic read. And, and like Jesse, I want to split my comments up uh, and to highlight some of the strengths of the book, but then also raising some points for, for discussion. Uh, three of each, I think nine minutes left, so a minute and a half to make three points. Um, so strength of the book. Um, firstly, I, I think it sounds a bit a bit blunt, but this is a very well constructed question in the sense that Denise is asking, is societal liberation possible in deeply divided societies? This is a very clear question. Many studies, many books that we read are not that clear in their objectives. They're also, they're also not that ambitious uh, in asking the big questions. And so I think, you know, I laud uh, Denise for being so ambitious. And then there's a secondary question. It does deliberation contribute to reconciliation? And if so, how? Um, these are big questions, as, as both uh, Jesse and Denise herself has recognized. Um, thinking about how we can bridge divides within society, um, these are questions that are not just relevant in post-conflict contexts. Indeed, if we start to think about polarized societies, we live in a polarized society, then the idea that deliberation could bring societies back together could also be thought of as sort of conflict prevention mechanism. Um, and so interestingly, I think that Denise's book, although it's very much focused on the post-conflict period, also has significant implications for conflict prevention. Second strength of the book, um, and, and Jesse highlighted this as well, um, Denise brought it out, is that this is really an empirical contribution to a theory-dominated area. Um, the phrase that Denise had uh, is that a lot of the work in this area is faith-based faith rather than fact-based. Um, and I think yeah, that's really, you know, really important. I remember it's 20 years ago since I took a class on deliberative democracy. Uh, I was in grad school at the time, that dates me. It was a class uh, taught by a political philosopher. It was a class in political philosophy. Mark Warren, familiar with his work? Um, I actually wrote a piece on transitional justice and deliberative democracy for that class. Um, I can't remember what it was about, but that was the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I should have shared. <laughs> <laughs> but it was purely theoretical. Um, now, yeah, this is a little bit out of my sort of regular area uh, of research myself. Um, but I'm certainly not aware, and um, Denise was just confirmed, that there has ever been such an ambitious effort to empirically test the theories, not just of deliberative democracy, but also theories that lie behind the logic of some track two problem solving workshops, sort of uh, Hellman type um, uh, problem solving workshops. You referred to that uh, in, your, in your last slide. That's Herbert, Herbert Hellman's work. Um, and so, what Denisa does is both take the theory, develop the theory in a very rich theoretical chapter, um, and then systematically test it. And she does this using phenomenally sophisticated methods. Um, and, and one great thing about the book is how transparent you are about the methods that you use, and you take the reader through each and every step um, in a way that opens you up but also means that um, it's very clear what the logic was behind each of your steps. Um, so this is my third sort of, uh, sort of highlight that methodological sophistication uh, can't really be, um, can't really be highlighted enough. Um, very clear questions. And what Denise does is effectively use different methods to answer different parts of her study. Um, and so she's interested in um, the, the conditions under which deliberation becomes possible in divided societies, who might be involved in such deliberation, what kinds of interactions facilitate deliberation. These are very big questions, uh, which invite, involve sort of large scale 
broad patterns. You can't answer these kinds of big questions through discourse analysis. And so what Denisa has done is, correct me if I'm wrong, but actually learned um, the statistical techniques for large scale, scale content analysis. Um, spent, as I recall, seven months coding the material that she introduced you to, um, and then run all of these statistical uh, tests on, on the data. That allowed her to answer some of her questions. What it didn't allow her to do was to think about how deliberation might contribute to reconciliation. What she could answer that question with is more of a discourse analysis. And so then there's a, a qualitative chapter. And so what you see in this book is very much sort of an arc from introducing themes to theoretical development, to quantitative analysis of, of sub-questions that can only be answered that way, to qualitative analysis, addressing a question that can only be answered that way, and then on to policy implications. And so it's a phenomenally well-structured project um, as, as well. And methodologically, um, this is not the Denise that I remember. <laughs> yeah, I don't mean that. I mean, I mean Denise is not a statistical, uh, uh, not a stats person, right? Um, and so there's been so much work that has gone into this. Um, and I think what is really important is that it shows that at any stage, we can acquire new skills as well. Um, and uh, we're moving towards multi-methods analysis. And it can be tempting for those of us, and I include me here, who don't have the skills that you have in statistical analysis, to say, right, I'm just going to be a qualitative analyst. Um, some of us try to get around that by working with quantitative scholars. I've done a bit of that on the side. But to actually acquire these skills and put them um, into a single study is phenomenally impressive. Um, so I really can't highlight that. Okay, that brings me to a few points that I want to bring up in terms of um, the, the discussion. Okay, firstly, I want to think about theory. Um, and so let me give you what I think is a very sort of um, potted uh, summary of the theory. Um, during Jordan Habermas, evidently, um, so the question here is, where is deliber deliberation in support of reconciliation possible in deeply divided contexts? And again, the common answer becomes, um, when there is communication, deliberative communication between parties, rather than debate. That's an important distinction, one I want to come back to. Um, and you can get this deliberative communication, uh, whether it's deliberative rationality, so effect effectively a respectful exchange of ideas, uh, and discourse and solidarity, uh, where parties grant recognition to one another. Um, this effectively leads to a mechanism of empathy, right? When one side explains their rationale for their understanding of a particular situation to the other, you effectively are put into a situation in one which one can be in the other's shoes. That builds empathy. Empathy is a mechanism that can facilitate reconciliation. Um, and this is borne out through the, you know, the very um, sophisticated methodological um, empirical analysis. Um, and you know, the really interesting finding is uh, what Denise highlighted earlier, which is that, in fact, it's when some of the most polarizing issues are under discussion that, in fact, you saw this process playing out. You saw empathy developing. You saw, therefore, ultimately reconciliation um, became a possibility. Um, and so this has become a counterintuitive finding, and it's something that's really important. What we might think are the most difficult topics to discuss actually are those that can contribute to reconciliation most. I think that this argument, and so this is the question, is it possible that this argument can be taken even further so that even what we think of as debate, defined in the book as really where there is, we see two interlocutors basically talking past each other, monologuing past each other. Is it not possible that even debate can give rise to empathy and reconciliation? Here's the logic. When you're engaged in the debate, you're not just putting forward your own reasons. You're trying to understand the reasons of the other party so that you can most effectively repeat them effectively. In order to put forward the validity of your own claim, you need to uphold your own claim and negate the claim of the other party. And so when there is that kind of debate and an effort to really validate one's own position, you do still need to empathize. That is by trying to understand the logic of the other party, although the objective is to refute that logic. Um, and so I think there's actually another form of reconciliation by stealth that is going on. Perhaps I'd be interested to hear whether or not in your observations you saw this. And that you may see parties that really don't want to 
understand each other, actually doing so as an unintended consequence of debate over some of these legal institutions. So I'd be interested to see whether or not there's any sort of empirical validity to that. Second set of issues um, I'd like to hear more about relates to sort of mechanisms of deliberation. Um, how del deliberation can bring about reconciliation. Um, and so is it largely that deliberation builds empathy, empathy builds reconciliation? Or is it also, and it, it is also, because it's in the book, but I'd like to hear more about it. Um, the deliberation um, in this sort of multi-ethnic, multi-demographic, different kinds of civil society actors, lawyers, you know, workers of various sort of backgrounds and beyond victims, that when they engage in this process, they also identify different identities that cross the ethnic divide, and that becomes the basis of commonality that allows them to move towards reconciliation. So victims become, they prioritize in that moment anyway being victims, no matter which side of the ethnic divide they're on. Families of victims identify with other families of victims. Um, Jesse, I know, is focused specifically on these different categories of victims, so I'd be interested to hear some more about that. Another point on this sort of mechanism moving from deliberation to reconciliation um, is, is it only the individuals involved in this process that are the beneficiaries of deliberation, or is there also the, the diffusion into the wider society? Because we know from the work of Tom Tillman, to whom I mentioned uh, referred earlier, the idea of sort of problems of the workshop, build empathy amongst a small select group of sort of uh, not elites, maybe second level elites, journalists and beyond, who then go out to society and diffuse transformed ideas of conflict in society, the degree to which that is effective is debated. But do the kinds of mechanisms that you're focusing on in the book, do they just relate to participants of the 6,000 individuals involved, or do you also know of diffusion or expect there to be diffusion? Last set of um, sort of comments and questions um, relate to the kinds of conditions under which everything you described, RECOM, can play out. Okay. When is RECOM possible um, in terms of you know, the processes that, that, that are described and when is it not? When are we likely to see efforts of deliberation succeed and fail? That's really you know, one of the key objectives of the book. But what was it particularly about RECOM? Was it the fact, was it with timing important? Was it the fact that it began in 2008, so sort of seven years after the last conflict, but going back to some 13 years after in the in date reports, wasn't that just enough time so that people could engage? But, um, you know, there was memories are still fresh in mind. Was it was timing a, a factor? Um, was it the role of civil society? You discussed that in the conclusion. Was it the fact that this was a consultation process? And so, in a way, the stakes were a little bit lower. Arguably, than a truth and reconciliation commission because this was about putting the rules together. And so, did that facilitate engagement? Um, was it the fact that it was a regional effort as well? Uh, and here's my very last point. Um, if there are certain conditions that contribute to the success of reform as a process rather than an outcome, um, then are there things that the international community can do? or domestic actors do to try to facilitate those conditions elsewhere. Um, because there are plenty of parts of the world um, where there's the potential for reform, but we don't see it. Um, and, and so if there can be some sort of facilitation effort, what forms might that change? But again, I mean, all I can say is a phenomenally impressive book um, and, and really should be congratulated for it. Thank you very much, uh, Desi and John. And the Misa, you have a very hard job of addressing some of these points in <laughs> five minutes or so, right. so that okay. we can have a discussion with you on uh, well. uh, Thank you very much for uh, engaging with the book and for this uh, really interesting uh, observations. I find it really interesting to see what you picked out, what, 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 what was it that uh, the book did for, for you, and also uh, I find the questions really. Um, really interesting and very pertinent. So I'll just start uh, with the question of um, uh, diffusion. I think that's a very important question because um, even though there were about 6,000 people overall uh, involved in the process, some of you were in the, 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 the consultations I particularly looked at, um, 
this is what we still call from the perspective of the this theory of deliberation a uh, deliberative mini path right so uh, and uh, and the, you know the question of diffusion the elephant in the room right um but I did mention it a little bit in in that that we actually maybe that's an easy way to out of it to say that we actually don't know um uh, the mechanism of diffusion. I don't think it's been in the research enough. Now I would say um the way I would prompt uh, knowing what happened with Reckon, I think um that kind of uh, our instinctive uh, sort of way of thinking about the relevance of diffusion is for it to scale up, right? As somehow vertical, to go somehow up there. But uh, I think that overlooks the importance of horizontal diffusion. And what I found interesting is that a few uh, people, and this was raised, I've been both in interviews and in focus groups. Uh, said that they shared their experience of participation in Reckon when they went home. They told the neighbor or all this. And this is where I yeah, thought, this is where some insights from the contact theory or vicarious contact, right? Hearing of someone doing something, right? Would be kind of quite interesting to kind of mobilize to understand. Um, what happens and what is the broader uh, relevance uh, uh, of this? That links up with uh, another question, uh, sort of um, kind of what, what does this do to sort of peace building in in uh, in general? And I think uh, I'm just kind of observing a very interesting kind of emerging kind of research agenda. Where people are looking at these post conflict contexts where there is a lot of work on us in our Bosnia, right? I could raise the question how could I be so naive and talk about reconciliation? But there is evidence there to be contrary. So, one the, the way to look at it, this would be that. Um, these um, exclusive uh, exclusive ethnic narratives um, are dominant in this society. This is why we worry about what's happening in there, but they're not a totalizing force. And this is what I find uh, quite uh, fascinating, that they haven't managed to kind of colonize every single space. So if you look at the Balkan, then I think Rectum would be just one of the examples where these kind of Almost you have these islands of civility that are kind of conquered, right? And this is not the sole example of, of interaction community or sort of um, collaboration and interaction that 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 that, that follows a completely different model, right? Rather than that that is dictated from uh, so kind of the complexity of these peace spaces, I think, is really, really interesting. That these kind of different dynamics that pull in different direction and to persist along with each other. Now, I understand that we would want to see the pendulum shift in one way, but I think, um, I think that, can, that can remain a, a desire and ambition, um, but it's very complicated to that, that, that I would, uh, that I would, uh, uh, I would uh, say. Um, um, So maybe the question about um, I'm not sure, Jesse, that I would I, I would have to say a lot about silence as such, uh, in a sense that I wouldn't be able to be accurate to tell you if this wasn't told. But I have very interesting insights in terms of for example, uh, based on uh, participation of women versus men and different sort of patterns, how victims participate as opposed to sort of professionals, right? Like just lawyers as, as opposed to civil society, which I think 
uh, provides very interesting insights in how different stakeholders participate in this process. At least it was kind of revelatory to me uh, to see, uh, 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 you, know, you know, how you can encourage people to actually speak up and, 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 and contribute, you know. So you could see the patterns, for example, where women would make just one statement and make sure that they constructed those statements and just, for example, you know, held off, right? As opposed to men, right, et cetera, et cetera. But on on the, 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 the so that is kind of, so science as such is not what, I, uh, or what I've looked at, but I would say, you know, the flip side of talking is also listening. <clears throat> and that's what I didn't study, but I think that would be also fascinating. Mm -hmm. And um, two years ago, I asked this effect. I, I, I heard of a couple of papers uh, that are, you know, developing the empirics, how to measure good listening, which I think is fascinating, but I haven't, I, I haven't done it. Um, Maybe I'll just stop here. But, uh... Uh, thank you very much. That was fantastic. And we will now give the floor to the participants, both online and in person. So to those of you wishing to ask a question, please uh, state your name and affiliation. We already have one question. So let's select three questions. Uh, hello, my name is Sasha. I'm from Afghanistan and I'm trying to be a friend of you well, thank you so much for this really in the um, discussion. Um, I wanted to know that in, in certain cases, for example, in my country where war has been really, really long for 30 years with Soviet invasion, Cold War, US involvement, and then now past 20 years, where international community, more than 45 countries were involved and they've also they've also been part of it. I wonder if someday we have a reconciliation. Because you 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 talked about the original commission, how would that look when when so many countries are involved and are part of it? And can true reconciliation happen if we just do it within ourselves while so many actors were involved to to create the war? Uh, so so how would that take place when so many countries are involved? Can we bring them around the table? And would it be representative of countries or citizens of them? How would that? Be? I'm sorry, it's, it's just a little... No, I think it's a, it's, it's, it, 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 it's a great question, right? Because it not only looks at internal complexity of what's happened uh, within Afghanistan, but also external actors. I think, uh, well, obviously, this can happen at, at, at different levels, right? So I was looking in particularly at the sort of civil society discussions. But say, for example, even if you started with with the with, with, with civil society, I think that would be a worthwhile um, sort of uh, exercise, right? Because um, in, for example, in the Balkans, you have the situation where uh, the same sort of uh, feeling that you know these wars, you know, they were not just the wars that happened between the groups or among the groups who were on the ground, right? External actors were involved from day from day one, and you could argue, uh, Richard has written uh, a book uh, previously to to the, to the latest one that I've used measuring peace for for Michael on uh, how decisions of external actors and recognition, they actually sort of change the force of war, right? Um, and perception of who's fighting for what. So here it is that sort of none of these wars is uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know kind of, uh, exist in uh, isolation. Uh, so I think it's important to, um, and then it creates, right? Um, afterwards, it does that creates some sort of dynamics that persist, right? So if you looked at it from the perspective of external actors uh, 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 who were involved, uh, you could argue that you know that is one dimension that could prevent reconciliation, right? Because you know the group say on this side with them, they supported them, right? That they can then that can even affect uh, if you like uh, European integration, right? And, and and you know it's kind of quite quite complex. I think one thing that I would take uh, uh, from this research, and that is uh, to actually 
trust the people. Trust the people in their ability to uh, sort of uh, open themselves up to that and the other, you know? Because, you know, I was, I was, um, so when I was doing this research, I was more expecting to find out, you know, to better understand, you know, uh, you know, what drops, right, the liberation, you know, so you can look at it that way. But, you know, instead, the results were so interesting that actually they lend themselves to better interpretation in terms of what opened them up. But the 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 the, the research with the uh, the focus groups and the interviews uh, was very insightful. You know, people told me about how anxious they were even at the thought of joining this this uh, this process. You know, um, they were afraid of what it would be like, especially for example, when I spoke to interviewees from post Albanians who actually went to Belgrade. Serbia, right? And they had they were involved in practically how they would they you know talk and when they realized that they were able to speak, it was almost empowering, right? So it almost kind of kick started this kind of virtuous sort of uh, circle when they were kind of readily express, expressing expressing uh, 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 their views. Uh, and you're right, you know, uh, what is interesting is that um, you know there is a sort of uh, I've worked in the book a lot with Cass uh, Sunstein's sort of idea of uh, uh, enclave deliberation, right? So the idea that, you know, the, the opinions will tend to go towards extremes, you know, where you have sort of polarized uh, ethnic groups, um, which, you know, not just my book, but other work on deliberation in, in, in divided societies, which have, you know, proves that, you know, actually it's a, you know, a contrary dynamics that that set in. So, so in a nutshell, just to, to, to come back to sort of other contexts, uh, A would be sort of um, um, trust the possibility of this kind of uh, communication that is, you know, uh, focused on 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 uh, problem solving, and for sure, uh, sort of the value of bringing all actors to the to the to the table to better understand sort of uh, what kind of different positions. I have a question. Sure. It's in many hands. So, um, is that the man in the back, and then David, and then off on that one. I'm Richard Seaburn. I worked at the Quaker Council of European Affairs in Brussels during the Balkan conflict period. And from a Quaker point of view, we looked at the dismay and disbelief. And, and uh, with my successors there have entertained young people from Croatia and Serbia in particular, you know, over meals and that sort of thing. And uh, with Great success. They did seem to integrate, and it worked very well. But that, of course, was groups of say sixteen people, and one again asked, "How does what? How does that disseminate?" Um, and particularly, one was one wonders about dissemination. If you, if one of the parties descends into a surveillance society where you don't dare say anything to your neighbour, um, and of course there is the risk. There is the risk. Um, that, that no one, too few people are wanting actually to get into a democratic situation, and the Trump, the Trump and the Boris Johnson world seems to prevail. But what I really wanted to talk about was that my daughter worked as a drama therapist in the Balkans during the period just after the war, and with and with depolarizing individual groups, not the joint groups. So that she actually, I mean, for example, in Sarajevo, she was using the example of Anne Frank to show that other people have had these problems and you don't have to think of yourself simply as a victim. Mm -hmm. and, and, and she, she actually worked in other, other parts of the world as well. But uh, as I say, there's a possibility of depolarizing literally as well as in groups. But sorry, one last bit to talk, which is presumably in the book. Who was the uh, recon? How was it founded? How was it financed? 
how do the invit how are the invitations set up? Uh, all of the, all the administrative side, I used to sort of serve them, uh, seems very puzzling to me, but a wonderful way to manage to do it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. David Mountain, Sea Socks. Um, thank you very much, Denise. Two quick questions. The first is um, thank you for introducing us to the concept of reconciliation by stealth. I suppose the balance is that by keeping it low level and depoliticizing, you might make results you might not otherwise make. I suppose the downside is that you risk muddying the clarity of the message that war crimes are just not tolerable. And the second question is, paradoxically, do you feel you've learned something about your own talk from your two excellent <laughs> discussions? Congratulations, <laughs> um, Denisa. I mean, I wouldn't expect something less from you because I've been following your work for many years now, as you know, always your approach was, you know, an alternative to the kind of standard, you know, traditional power politics, uh, you know, uh, Balkan studies. Uh, and uh, wonderful to see. I'm looking forward to reading and see your quantitative side as well of your work. Really great. Well done. Now, my question is actually insisting on John's question because I had it in my mind as well. Um, what is the relevance of time in this? Uh, you know, what if it is closer to the conflict? What is the most appropriate time to have those kinds of, uh, of deliberations? Also to connect it with uh, Marilena's work uh, on uh, refugee trauma and memory, okay? Um, do you see a generational uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, variance um, in these kinds of, of discussions where those who have lived through the trauma uh, are um, less talkative and you know the next generation becomes a little bit more engaging. Um, the, the notion of time, I think, is particularly important. If you could bring that as well in the discussion. Mm -hmm. And I know that we have more questions. But can I have my questions because it's in alignment with the previous questions as well? So I think that your uh, book does a fascinating job, especially challenging uh, the hegemonic perspective that dominates uh, the literature. Because you're trying to capture a very multi level uh, concept. Uh, you define transnational, uh, transnational transitional justice in relation to states, in relation to societies, in relation to individuals. And what is fascinating is that you're following, uh, you consider the top down approach, but it focuses on a bottom up uh, perspective in order to capture this multi level uh, concept. And to do that, you have um, mixed methods uh, research design, bringing together insights uh, generating from different methodologies. So um, I was also wondering about you know, the role of science that uh, Jesse mentioned and the role of trauma and mostly the relationship between history, memory, and trauma. Mm -hmm. um, how, because science and trauma pervade uh, the creation and the construction of history in different ways of level and levels is the making of the sources, the making of the archives, the making of the narratives. So it's another multi-dimensional and another uh, multi-level concept that you have to capture, which is very challenging as a dog. So I was wondering how do you see this relationship? So um, should I answer? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um Lots of questions here, but because I've got two, two, so uh, yes, I owe the question, like the question of time. Um, it's, uh, I think, I think it's a, it's a great question. You know, when when is this possible? So I think what made uh, reform possible, I think, was realization, not just civil society groups that uh, victims themselves. But actually, their position of victimhood is a very good sort of a political resource for politicians, right? So um, they realize that this, you know, uh, the, in the political discourse, the victims are used in, say, so, you know, in the context of this competitive victimhood, you know, for sort of points, you know, uh, play up this post-conflict post nationalism. 
But when it came to actually recognizing what happened to the victims from the own, their own group, you know, nothing was forthcoming, right? No reparation, no recognition, etc. And this is what causes, I think, this shift. And I thought that was kind of very interesting that, you know, you would have people who you would say were more on the national side, right? But then kind of joined this um, initiative where they come face to face with those, uh, with those uh, ethnic others. So I wouldn't say necessarily that it was the distance uh, from the conflict because this was in the early 2000s, and you know the conflicts ended at different stages, right, in the Balkans. But all these kind of dynamics, these sort of exclusive and et et ethnocentric narratives, they have set in already, right? And even though, you know, there's a lot of talk about trauma, the nations, suffering, etc., this was all self centered. Uh, sort of a productive political narrative that really left the victims, you know, to hang out by themselves. So I thought that was a very interesting dynamic that brought sort of the most uh, improbable sort of interlocutors, you know, into conversation. So that was uh, um, on the history of uh, of uh, 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 Rancon. I think uh, sort of that kind of touches on something that we haven't really discussed, but I will really discuss it in great details. It was supported by local civil society, but this these groups were they're dependent on foreign donations. There is no uh this to, uh, uh no so that it, that that makes uh, sort of these initiatives possible. So what I think it's very interesting because. You know, among other concepts that are kind of solid and instrumentalized in post conflict society, civil society is one. Okay. So, for example, um, these uh, sort of uh, civil society human rights organizations are called mercenaries because they are taking uh, external funding. And when I was writing a book, you know, other work on civil society that I've done, and when I talked to my students, you know, uh, we have to understand that these post-conflict societies, there are no other sources of funding, right? In these situations, the state is there to prevent civil society and human rights groups uh, from doing the work they do because they chip away their narratives, as you said, right? So the only sources that they have is to look at just sort of outside of the funding, which puts them in a very good position, right? opens them up to criticism that they're not doing things genuinely, you know, because they don't care, but they're doing that managers to earn their good and salary, which uh, when you uh, meet, uh, I'm not saying that there are bad apples, there are bad apples everywhere, but when you meet uh, the people who kind of tirelessly, you know, go and collect these statements, and, and genuinely are traumatized by that experience. I think that's not a job that one would do for, you know, um, um, you know euros, dollars or euros. Um, so, so that is a kind of, uh, uh, kind of what actually made, made it, uh, uh, made, made the uh, uh, reform possible. Um, I think, uh, so now the way Marilena, your and often this question kind of overlaps in the in relation to trauma. You know, um uh some of these meetings that I um, that I uh, attended and also this is kind of this evident in the data uh, were very emotional, you know. Um, um you know, people did discuss concrete things, you know, for example, where to put the seat of the commission or whatever, but quite often, you know, to, to explain why something should be somewhere or whatever, what their position was, they would, they would, they would it was almost compassionate, right? So the trauma did sort of fill in the room and you would see it and everybody just fall silent. You could just almost really feel the emotion the emotion in the room. 
And it is interesting how in those moments, uh, your rights for people, you know, uh, to activate those other identities that they have, which is, you know, quite a development in itself, because everything that you have, all the political uh, sort of dynamics that, that these societies are there to conflate all one's identities into um, ethnic identities. Mm -hmm. um, I found it quite interesting that, you know, and this is something that I haven't explored sufficiently, that people were able to um, identify each other because they recognized that they belong to the same class. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if there's something kind of uh, Yugoslav about that, but they thought that they were they were wearing similar clothes, right? Mm -hmm. On the basis of that, they made the conjecture, you know, that they are kind of the same. You know, so they were sort of all of a sudden they were finding those uh, those commonalities, and it was quite interesting how. The more disagreements they, they saw that was within groups, that they kind of created these kind of solidarities across groups. So that was that. Uh, um, that that was uh, um, uh, that was the question of time, and also another very interesting moment in terms of time. I think that the dynamics um, works. Quite differently in the Balkan, that people who were involved are very much engaged or who have the memory, right? Whereas the youth are more disengaged and kind of socialized and this. But actually, because this uh, whole initiative was so diverse, right? And, you know, they were just inviting people almost random, it's not a random selection, but there's you know, someone who would like to do or join or whatever. There were some people, young people, and I actually did interview them as well for them. It was a great education experience as well because they, you know, learned uh, history, including the history of the 90s from the textbooks that told, tell just one story. So I had one interview, we just found it, you know, it was not a completely, you know, open uh, to the, the new history, right, um, uh, 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 to her. And here is actually sort of maybe I should not uh, sort of end uh, with the limitation of this research, right? In that you know this is a, data is so valuable because it captures you know as I said naturally occurring discussions, but it's also limited uh, in that you don't have the data of how old you know they are. So if you do the experimental research, you don't have all that in, you know, in, in, in information. So, you know, but anyway, if it opens up to the sparks and other sort of uh, uh, better research designs or sort of explorations of uh, individual dimensions, uh, it's still great. That was very insightful. How do people talk about war uh, crimes and how do people don't talk about war crimes? Yeah. Uh, especially through the Bible of the next one, from the next to the class, to uh, the role of emotions and individual agency. Um, very last questions, very, very last questions. Brilliant. Uh, and then, okay. Yeah, thanks. I'd just like to mention my name and I'm a bit of things I don't hear from the European Union. Uh, but I would just like to mention the age of Northern Ireland and, and recommend that you look at, if you're not familiar with it already, the work of the Oxal Commission in the early 90s. This was a deliberative process where a commission uh, consisting of quite a high level people on both sides of the community, and it was on our side, traveled around Northern Ireland to have kind of town hall meetings or deliberative meetings in many, many different venues. And one of the significant points that emerged in their report, which is a published uh, uh, report in the library here and in uh, St. Andrews, uh, among other places, um, was the concept of the parity of esteem. That really the two communities had to be treated equally uh, all through. There couldn't be a hierarchy, there couldn't be, a, you know, and that this, this had both kind of trivial and quite serious consequences. The trivial consequence was that the footnotes were actually checked to make sure you had as many references on one side as you had on the other. <laughs> and, but the serious consequence was that the, the, the formulation of power sharing in the Good Friday Agreement goes back to this work. 
And the power sharing meant that power was shared, that no one side could outvote the other, that you have to have double consent in order to get uh, law and policy decisions in the Northern Ireland administration. So what uh, something crawled up from that was that there were strong incentives for the for cross-community cooperation, uh, both in the terms of the agreement that this was built in in the, in the procedures and in funding for cross-community incentives on a large scale from Brussels and uh, not least. And, uh, so these were the kind of things that flowed out or, and it, it represented a very positive contribution then at the at the governance level of a deliberate process in the early 90s is reported in early 1992, made into the what became the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and there was one kind of motto that came out, um, I, I was, I, I was uh, I've been an Irish diplomat, and my colleagues uh, like to phrase, I'd like to pass on, the future is more important than the past. That was a very common refrain in this possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you for that. Right. I will. I will look at that. I was. Uh, yes. I will, I will look at that. Yeah. I just wanted to go back to what John Bedhill's question about, um, you know, whether the development of dialogue was facilitated by the fact that it was about setting up, up a commission. So it was about process rather than about outcome. You you yourself said uh, that uh, the failure, in quotes, of Raycon was perceived because it didn't yield a definitive outcome of the establishment of mission. But as it, you, your view of it is that it succeeded because of because of the existence of the process which led to the draft uh, uh, statute. Um, I, 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 I wonder how far the question that John posed is relevant. I mean, I think, you know, having a process, uh, you know, I speak as a former e EU official, um, you know, somebody once said that the EU has succeeded in reducing national arguments by making them boring. <laughs> uh, I just wondered what you thought about this. Um, so so uh, well, they, I think, they did not set out the process, you know, not to achieve the outcome. I think they, they tried very hard. And I think um, even the EU didn't back them when they uh, sort of, uh, uh, sought uh, sort of stronger political support um, uh, from 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 the EU. So um, um, so that's uh, kind of uh, where you are. So what what, what the Reform has done? They've modified sort of uh, their modus operandi now. But I just thought that. From the perspective, you know, um, you know, someone interested in a sort of academic way in terms of uh, what was achieved, we need to better understand what the process can or cannot do, yeah. you know, and there are obvious, and again, ending with a sort of a, 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 a limitation. But I mean, as long as uh, sort of, uh, we capture that something did happen, you know. And if you meet even sort of occasionally when I meet people who participated so many years later on, you know, they still remember, right? Uh, this, this this moment and this kind of extraordinary experience and exchange, and not to mention that the links across ethnic groups that were sort of uh, sort of made among some people, they 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 they, they survive to this day. So um you know, I mean, you know, we can't really, um, in peace building, um, sort of uh, hope for uh, like a big bang kind of change overnight. And I think the, the best we can hope for, for for some incremental changes that go push in the same direction, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So this seminar is coming to an end uh, with Denise uh, uh, acknowledging the limitations and with us acknowledging the strengths. Fascinating book. Uh, so for a few thanks are due, first of all, to our brilliant uh, speakers. And please join me in congratulating Denisa for her excellent uh, book. Thank you again for hosting and for such a uh, really nice observation, Jesse, as well. Um, Thank you. Congratulations again. <laughs>